and I'm so pleased to be able to present Dr. Mona Minton and Dr. Andrea Dauber. Dr. Dauber has been so key in our planning of this conference, and we really are so appreciative of everything that she's brought to us with her real world experience to um, really help us make this a much more effective conference than it ever would have been without your involvement, uh, Dr. Dauber. So thank you so much for all of that. Dr. Minton and, and Dr. Dauber are now gonna present Reentry is a Journey, Challenges and Chances When Leaving Incarceration. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. I will let Dr. Minton go first. And in the meantime, I will share my screen with all of you. Hi. <laughs> Happy Saturday, everybody. I, I just want to share a little bit teary eye. I just wanted to start by saying definitely touched with all the stories I've heard throughout the day today that on a Saturday to spend quality time to hear this amazing work that everybody is doing and working on their journey and healing and not giving up is just breathtaking. So thank you for everyone who has shared their story. It just feels amazing to know that people out there are not giving up and that they are helping others to not give up as well. It's an honor to hear these amazing stories. And it feels amazing to know that we provide these type of services and work to continue to help the population that is underserved and that we appreciate to continue to help this population and help them through this journey because it's a really tough thing to get them recognized because maybe there are folks that can fight through this, but there are definitely folks that just don't have the family, the support system, the financial support system, the emotional to actually get the help they need to be successful. So just wanted to take a moment to recognize that. My name is Dr. Mona Minton. I'm with Neighborhood House Association, and I am the general manager, oversee all the social services program. We currently have anywhere between four to five different types of reentry services program. We just got awarded a new reentry program through the DA for the sentencing reentry service program for long-term services for folks coming out of the prison system, which is an amazing pilot study program that we are excited to start. I would like to turn it over to Dr. Dabra Griffin, who will talk more in detail what we do. NHA is extremely well known in the San Diego County to provide more so on the Head Start, early Head Start services for children from infant to age five for educational services for Head Start. And we have 17 to about 20 social services program, such as Black Infant Health, HIV programs, senior centers, adult day health care. If you go on our website, all of our programs are listed, but we have Tons of adult services program, ages 18 up, and we are very well known in the San Diego County. We are one of the largest nonprofit program. We are actually rated one of the top nonprofit in San Diego County. And we continue to grow, especially in the reentry justice involved program. We were actually the first to provide reentry services 10 years ago. And that is one of the programs that Dr. Dauber Griffin is going to focus on talking about how we have been very successful in providing reentry services. And we have been proven to show that reentry services pre and post has shown reduced recidivism, improved quality of care, case management through peer services, therapeutic services, transportation services has improved healing. Employment services has improved quality of care for success in relationship building, quality care through mental health, substance use, reduction with use, going into group services such as NA, AA, and also evidence-based practice group services as well. So 
I will turn it over to Dr. Dauber Griffin and any questions we will answer after the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Minton. You just helped my entire presentation. I guess I'm ready to take questions. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Nice try. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Andrea Dalbert Griffin, and I'm the Senior Executive Director over at NHA's InReach Entry Entry Programs. And I'm also on the board of UNA San Diego Chapter. And it's a true pleasure to be here today and spend time with all of you. We've had so many great presentations and I'm truly thankful to see that so many of you have chosen to stay around until the late evening hours. So thank you for that. I wanna kind of highlight also that the majority of our experiences with jails. So we've kind of talked a lot about prisons throughout the day and incarceration obviously is also something that pertains to the jail system. So. I have put together some challenges as we're talking about this transition from incarceration to the community. If you were around for Lawrence Larry's talk earlier, you heard him talk a little bit about what those challenges might look like. And we have generally individual level challenges, but we also have system level challenges. And you can see here on the left-hand side, I've listed some of those individual level challenges simple things such as obtaining a, an ID or a driver license. A lot of folks have accumulated tickets that will not allow them to actually obtain their driver license back unless they pay off their tickets, for example, or unless they take DUI classes, which also cost money. And a lot of folks who come out of incarceration just simply don't have the financial means to be able to do that right away. But they need to get places. They need to get around. They are as busy, if not busier than many of us are. And if you rely on the public transportation system, it can be very difficult and challenging to get to all of your appointments on time. So for example, transportation assistance is usually a huge need for individuals who come out of incarceration. And there's other things such as finding a place to stay. Not everybody can go to a halfway house. Typically, if you come out of a prison, stay prison, you may be afforded that opportunity. But if you come out of jail, you can't go to a halfway house. And it really depends on the county that you are coming from. What has that county put together as far as resources and a support service system for those who are incarcerated in jails? And so a lot of the jailed population actually return routinely back to the streets, right back into homelessness, which is where they came from. Then we have, of course, financial resources is a huge issue. We specifically focus on those who live with serious mental illness and co-occurring challenges, right? So they live with serious mental illness and they live with substance use disorders. And when you are burdened with these disorders, it is very difficult to function at a level where you can secure employment, pursue employment. A lot of the time clients or participants are able to secure employment, but they can't maintain it, uh, perhaps because they can't you know, maintain their mental health in a way that is conducive to maintaining their employment. And so typically, financial resources are a huge problem. Some clients or participants receive SSI or SSDI, but not all of them do. So a lot of what we do, and I'll talk a little bit more about what we do in a minute, um, but I kind of wanted everybody to get an appreciation really for the multitude of challenges that arise when people come out of incarceration. And so sometimes what we're able to do is help program participants connect with employers, maybe even obtain a job, and then coach them along the way to make sure they can stay employed. We are dealing with issues around creating a different meaning in life. You've heard about this from our speakers today who have been incarcerated, who spend time in prison and jail kind of having to, I think Lawrence said that very well when he said, I had to learn that everything I knew and everything I thought was true was wrong. And that is a very difficult transition uh, for anybody, frankly, in life to have to come to the realization that the way you think, the way you believe and, and what you hold dear to your heart may not be the way in life and may continuously get you in trouble. So kind of working with folks who come out of incarceration to question their life histories, their life stories, and help them build a new narrative, something they can lean on and work towards is obviously a challenge in and of itself. 
And then we don't talk about it much, but also addressing those criminal thinking patterns that a lot of people struggle with while they're still incarcerated and after they've been incarcerated. So uh, addressing criminogenic risks and needs is extremely important and evidence-based programs typically strive to do that, which is why they're evidence-based. They lean on research that has been shown to highlight factors that have been um, associated with recidivism, right, which is the return return to criminality. It depends on how you define it. Could be the return to criminality, could be the return to jail or prison. On the system level, there are so many issues, and I think we've touched on some of those throughout the day today. But for example, we are a service provider who likes to work with peers. We call them peer specialists. Those are essentially individuals who have spent time incarcerated and who have come out of incarceration, have turned their lives around, and are now looking to give back to the community through serving as a peer or as a peer specialist. We actually have a training program for peer specialists specialists with incarceration history. It's called the Peer Reentry Leadership Academy. We train peers, they go through our academy, they come out, they graduate, and they are ready to go into jobs, paying jobs, uh, where they can now work with individuals who are incarcerated and coming out of jail or prison. But to get them clearance to where they can go into those institutions is really a huge barrier. There are many other system level barriers that I could talk on forever. And the reason I could talk on forever is because this is my daily bread and butter. These are the daily issues that we confront in our work with individuals who leave incarceration. So what are the available solutions? What we have found in our programs is that what works really well is establishing that pre to post release care transition, right? So we start working with individuals while they are incarcerated. We start having difficult conversations, but also important conversations with them about what they need to change and how they feel about that change. And then together, we put together a so-called post-release transitional plan or a treatment plan or a care plan. And then we assist individuals as they come out of jail and prison, literally from the gate. Our program staff pick up clients as they walk out of the gate, because research and our experience has shown that when we're not there to pick them up as they come out of jail or prison, they are walking away and we cannot re-engage them into services. So it's very, very important that we are there exactly the minute they walk out of jail so we can pick them up. Obviously, therapeutic interventions, uh, we're now offering groups again, post-release, in person, giving people a space where they can come together, find some sort of solace in the fact that there are others who have had similar challenges in life and who they can talk together about available solutions. Housing is a huge issue, not just in San Diego County, but also in other counties. So providing housing is huge. You have to have housing. You have to be able to give people a place to stay even if just for a short period of time, if you want them to be successful. Of course, we need to be what we always call culturally competent, right? So we need to have staff who reflect the the population that we serve. The Neighborhood House Association is probably the most diverse organization in the county of San Diego, nonprofit organization. And that is absolutely necessary. The vast majority of our participants come from Latino, Latinx, and and African-American and immigrant communities. So obviously... We need to be in tune with their specific cultural needs and beliefs and so on and so forth. On the system level, we as an organization have only so much impact. A lot of my daily work consists of creating partnerships and creating alliances and really looking for resources that we can offer to our participants, building relationships with law enforcement agencies. Um, We have very strong relationships with the Sheriff's Department here in San Diego County, as well as with the Probation Department, is extremely vital to help incarcerated individuals transition out and stay out of jail and prison. Networking, you know, not every agency can offer all the resources that are needed. So knowing who to go to for what specific resource uh, to help participants is very, very important. Dr. Golding earlier this morning spoke about sort of the prevalence of serious mental illness or mental illness in general and co-occurring disorder. I just kind of have, again, a summary slide here and you can see uh, just in the jail population, About 70% of individuals that are incarcerated in jail at any given moment in time live with a serious mental illness. 
And that is a very high share. And Dr. Golden this morning also spoke about similar percentages for the prison population. So what are our goals? Dr. Minton briefly alluded to this. So of course, we want to assist individuals with being better able to manage their mental health, their general well-being, physical health. We have recently added nurses to the team. We're extremely happy about that because a lot of our program participants have real serious unmanaged physical health issues that have been lingering for a long time. We want to make sure that as people come out of incarceration, they experience a organized, safe transition back into the community where they can connect with other service providers that will meet their needs. That could be anything from social services to housing to family-based services. There is a wide range of need that we usually find in our population. So we have to make sure we meet all of those needs. We advocate to reduce the stigma around mental health and substance use, and it's sometimes very difficult to be able to talk about these things. So our staff and our peer specialists especially are there to help participants have these conversations in a safe space that is trauma-informed, where individuals are not re-triggered and where they can take their baby steps forward. And of course, as I mentioned, we train peers that have that lived experience to serve as leaders in re-entry, and we do want to bring them back into our workforce. And some of the services we offer, clients or participants can choose um, between and among all of these services. Um, So as you can see, we use evidence-based practice. We have clinicians on staff. We have substance use case managers on staff. Now also nurses. We assist clients with employment support services, transitional housing. We offer transportation assistance. So my staff will literally have clients in their cars and drive them to their appointments to make sure they get to their appointments because they are typically rather important appointments. And of course, we now offer support and educational groups as well. We did that in the past in the jail. It was discontinued at some point when we started focusing on those living with serious mental illness, but now we're picking those groups up again post-release. We also have a faith-based component. So we actually have contracts with four churches here in the county. And to those clients who wish to receive that service, we offer it because we recognize that different things work for different people. Just want to briefly highlight, does the service that we offer work? And just based on the limited data that we collect, yes, it works. We have a reduced recidivism rate. So our services started over 10 years ago. The cumulative recidivism rate is only 20%, right? So across all the past 10 years, measuring how many of our program participants return to incarceration, that rate is 20%. Very important, over 80% of those that come into our programs and release from jail or prison actually start services with a behavioral health provider. That is also very important because usually there's a drop um, in people connecting to those services as they leave incarceration. And over 50% of those who go through our programs end up being able to self-sustain. They are able to pay their rent. They are able to maintain employment. And those are the three main markers we use. Just briefly highlight the call to action. What can you do? This is incredibly important work. And I will tell you, this is also very difficult work. The burnout rate is high among staff, Um, especially for individuals who come out of jail, usually poorly medicated, uh, often have no place to go. We are there at the front line. And so what can you do to support? Well, you can choose to volunteer or give time to a program or to organizations that serves those who are incarcerated, whether it's in jail or in prison. You can also become politically involved, educate yourself about important criminal justice bills that go through the legislature of your state and find out how you can become a part of advocacy or opposition for bills that are currently um, on the table. And of course, you can attend future conferences, whether it's with this coalition or any other board or agency or committee, and continue to educate yourself. And lastly, of course, you can get in touch and talk with us. I have included our email addresses here. And again, I want to thank you all so much for staying around and listening. And we'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Uh, Just a quick one. What is a warm handoff? 
Oh, that's a great question. So a warm handoff is when you have a participant in a program or in a service and you need to get them connected to another provider for their specific programs or services. And so, you know, in our world, we talk a lot about referrals and such, but when what our experience is, when we give somebody a phone number and say, call that organization or call that program, it simply does not happen. And it has a lot to do with the trauma that people carry, you know, issues around self-advocacy. And so what we do is a warm handoff. What that means is we take the participant, we help them organize that appointment, right, or even getting in touch with the other service provider, because sometimes that's a challenge. And then we literally make sure we take them to their appointment and hand them off to a staff member, to somebody that we know at that organization, so they can seamlessly continue services with them. That's what a warm handoff is. Oh, thank you. Sounds wonderful. Mm -hmm. I could use some of those. <laughs> Yeah. Sometimes we all can use warm handoffs for sure. Are people released to the care of your agency? Because I was kind of interested when you said yes. you had to pick them up. Yes. But, and so they are released to the care. Is that on parole? Well, you're dealing with jail, right? So we have a system in place in the county where that is why I mentioned the strong collaboration with the Sheriff's Department and Probation Department because client or individuals are referred to us while they're still in jail or prison. So we at that point go and visit and explain to them what services are available and if participants want to come into the program, we complete all of that intake right while they're still in custody. And then yes, they get released to us. They can obviously choose to get released to self we don't force them to get released to us. It's an option, but the vast majority of program participants choose to get released to us because they know we will be there to pick them up. We will make sure they have clothes. We will make sure they have food. They have a place to stay. And all of those services are not easy to come by when you're on your own. You don't have an ID. You don't have a phone. You don't have transportation or none of that is in place. It's very difficult to accomplish all of that. So, because I know you said you collaborate with other agencies, like let's say I was just coming out of jail mm -hmm. and I didn't have a place to stay. You don't run halfway houses though. So yeah. would I be collaborating with another agency? So we don't run halfway houses. What we do is we have contracts in place with, with housing providers in the county. But those are housing providers that accept justice involved as well as not justice involved residents into their homes. And who pays for that? Does the person coming out or, or your agency? We have several contracts. They could be county contracts or state contracts. Um, and that is how we pay for those services. So when we, when we go in and bid for a contract, we make sure to put money down for those essential services as opposed to putting it into salaries or whatever else. We make sure we cover those basic services so that we can offer a wraparound model. And how many people do you serve in general, like every month or so? In a fiscal year, we serve over, I think we're up to over 700 um, individuals that come out of custody. And I, I always like to say this, when I started in 2016, I had about three and a half staff. And over time, we're now in 2022, we're up to about 35 full-time staff. And it just really shows how great the need is for these services and how important it is you you know to expect somebody to come up out of incarceration be that short term or long term and kind of expect them to figure it out on their own is a really high expectation and a lot of people are simply not able to do it not because they don't have the intellectual capacity but simply because there are so many obstacles and barriers in the road that it becomes a real challenge to be successful after leaving incarceration I was wondering, where do you get your funding from? Is it all from donations? Do you get it through United Way? Is it county money, taxpayer money? Can you yeah. address that, please? So we get MHSA Act funding. Um, so it's Mental Health Services Act funding. But we also get some funding from the Sheriff's Department. And now, as of late, we're, we're going to be receiving funding from the District Attorney's Office. So it's a mix of funding sources. And that's all money that we have to solicit. It's not just given to us, obviously. We have to put out bids and proposals and hopefully, you know, somebody will see the value of this work and fund it. Do we have statistics on if these types of services are done, then there's less recidivism is what mm -hmm. I'm hearing, but does it also help 
these people not become homeless? And then does, does that ease the system for trying to help the homeless by default? Yes. And I have to give you a quick answer, but let's just say the share between those who come into our program and the share of those of, that are homeless is like upwards of 90%, right? So the vast majority of our participants are homeless when they come into the system and they are homeless when they come out of the system. So yes, in a way, the program services do meet also the issue of homelessness. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Minton and Dr. Dauber. And I want to thank you uh, very much for this enlightening and informational presentation about the challenges of transitioning from incarceration to community, a very important subject. And you educated us about reentry items that very few of us even thought about or knew about. Thank you. Thank you.